Second half of September 1942. When you are oppressed in your own country and then you're threatened by invasion or even invaded by a foreign power, do you overlook your oppression and support the national defense? Or do you consider your enemy's enemy your friend? Or maybe you just choose to fight your own war regardless? These are the choices facing millions of people in India, Yugoslavia, and the Soviet Union in 1942. This is War Against Humanity, a subseries in World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Last episode, we saw the Vichy French government impose forced labor laws on its citizens, succumbing to German demands for more workers. As a result, resistance operations began to organize themselves more effectively. In Eastern Europe, the massacre of Jews continued, but more and more Jews stood up to fight back. It was a new beginning for anti-Nazi resistance. In late September 1942, an allied country, Great Britain, also faces rising resistance by people they have subjugated. Since Burma fell a few months ago, the Japanese Imperial Army is on the doorstep of British India. The situation inside India is politically, economically, and ethnically complicated. The British Raj rule is ostensibly pan-Indian, but in practice it is a complicated quilt of various degrees of autonomy, quasi-self-ruled regions, and direct British rule. Demands for some form of independence for all of India have gone largely unanswered. Attempts at rebellions have been brutally quelled on several occasions in the past three decades. But ever since Mahatma Gandhi's peaceful protest in the Salt March of 1930, the calls for independence have grown. Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, another leader of the Hindu independence movement of the Indian National Congress Party, fell out after the Salt Marsh failed to lead to dominion status. The same independence that, for instance, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa have achieved. But at the outbreak of war, both Gandhi and Nehru separately backed the British war effort and called for cooperation. A third leader of the Congress party, Subhas Chandra Bose, then split from them and called for massive civil disobedience to protest any involvement of the Indians in the war and make renewed calls for immediate independence. The British arrested him, but soon released him. Bose then fled to Germany. His idea was that his enemy's enemy must be his ally. In September 42, he is still in Berlin and has set up the Free India Legion, where over 3,000 Indians captured by the Germans when fighting for Britain and some volunteer Indian expatriates in Europe have now changed sides and are fighting under the Wehrmacht. Bose finds himself in an awkward position, though. With socialist sympathies, he is an admirer of the Soviet system and the USSR, whom the forces he has rallied are now fighting. But that is a story for another day. Back in India, the country continues to divide. The upper classes benefit from the war economy, but the vast majority of Indians in the farming classes are pressed with more and more taxes to finance the war, while their crops are being sold at regulated prices to the army. In Bengal and Assam, there is real fear of a Japanese invasion driving some there towards the side of the British. In the north, the Muslims are generally supportive of the British for reasons of their own. Back in 1940, the British indicated to the Muslim nationalists that they could get their own nation in the Pakistan Declaration. The Muslim nationalists have since vocally supported the British war effort. Nero and Gandhi rightly saw this as a rule by division by the British, reunited and jointly called for limited acts of civil disobedience. They still stood with the British in the war, though, seeing the Axis as the greater threat. In the summer of 42, they finally get hope for Dominion status again, when Prime Minister Churchill sends the leader of the House of Commons, Stafford Cripps, to India to negotiate. But by July 1942, negotiations have broken down and Gandhi and Nero abandoned the ideas of cooperation with the British. On August 8th, they publicly called for the British to quit India altogether and rally hundreds of thousands of Indians to join in peaceful civil disobedience. While the mass protests assemble across the country on August 9th, the British promptly arrest the Congress party leaders. Gandhi and several of them are put under house arrest at the Aga Khan Palace. But the protests don't abate. With the party decapitated, violence and vandalism erupts. 
Until September 21st, 550 post offices and 250 railway stations are attacked. Many rail lines are dug up and 2,500 telegraph lines cut. 70 police stations are destroyed and 85 other government buildings burned down or wrecked. In the city of Balia, the protesters even overthrow the local administration, break the local Congress party leaders out of jail, and proclaim the city independent. The government deploys 57 battalions of British troops to restore order. Around a thousand protesters are killed by gunfire or in stampedes as the military and police charge the assemblies. Soon, over 100,000 are held as political prisoners. Massive fines are levied at protesters and systematic public floggings of rioters are instituted to dissuade further unrest. On September 29th, the situation comes to another showdown. In the town of Tamluk in West Bengal, some 6,000 quit India protesters are marching into town to picket the police station. Most of them are women, and their leader is 71-year-old Matangini Hazra, affectionately known as Gandhi Buri, Bengali for Old Lady Gandhi. There's a heavily armed roadblock ahead, and Matangini, carrying the flag of the Indian Congress, steps out ahead of the procession, urging them to stay peaceful. But she marches on. The police open fire at her. The next day, Biblabi newspaper reports. She continued to advance with the tricolor flag, leaving all the volunteers behind. The police shot her three times. She continued marching, despite wounds to the forehead and both hands. As the bullets hit her, she keeps chanting, Vande Mataram, Hail to the Motherland. But she is mortally wounded. Still holding the flag high, she falls to the street. Her death and that of another thousand will not dissuade the protesters. And despite virtually all of their leaders now imprisoned, protests and the creation of parallel governments will continue in the months to come. To the northwest in Eastern Europe, even bloodier crackdowns by the Germans on their occupied subjects are also not doing any better to curb resistance. Slipping through forests, swamps, and mountains under protection of the lengthening autumn nights, the partisan disrupts the German war effort by laying mines and blowing up infrastructure. There is little the Germans can do. By the time they can scramble a response, the combatants are long gone, so the German and local collaborationist police step up their violence against local civilians in an attempt to cut partisan support. Hitler's August order to pick up anti-partisan activities increases those actions once again. At the same time, in sudden raids and ambushes, the partisans have been assassinating German and non-German administrators and collaborators. Anyone not actively working for the partisans has been suspected of contributing to German stability and is a target for murder. Mayors, teachers, farmers, and their families. In the Soviet Union, local partisans trying to protect their own local population by entering temporary truces with the Germans to allow their families and friends to flee have even been labeled enemies of the socialist state and actively persecuted by Stalin's regime. So anyone not actively working for one or the other side is with the enemy, as well as anyone actually working for the other side, effectively condemning any civilian to die no matter what. Now, since the Axis invasion in many parts of Eastern Europe, for reasons of communist or ethnic pre-war oppression, large parts of the population have been unwilling to support the resistance, in many cases even prone to support the Germans. If you're in the Soviet Union and you're not a communist or happen to be part of the many ethnic minorities Stalin sees as enemies of the socialist state, the Germans might look like liberators. If you're in Yugoslavia and you happen to not be a Croat in the Croat-led Nazi client state, the NDH, or you're not a Serb in the occupied part of the country, even after invasion, you're also faced with oppression by the regional majority. So while the communist nature of Soviet partisans have worked to their disadvantage in Yugoslavia, Tito's partisans have benefited from being ethnically blind, so to say. In any case, the situation for the average civilian is that they have been caught between a hard spot and a rock, or several rocks, if you like. But that is about to change. Okay, so I am going to use the situation in Belarus in September 1942 as an example today. But what is happening there is also happening to varying degrees in occupied Yugoslavia, the rest of the Soviet Union, and in Poland. 
all over these territories, the Nazis keep on stepping up their retaliatory actions. So, for example, in Belarus on September 22nd and 23rd, Battalion 310 of the Ordnungspolizei, Opu, eradicates the civilian population of three villages. In Borki, 203 men, 372 women, and 130 children are marched out of the town, forced to dig their own graves, and shot. In Zabloitze, 284 people are shot in a local school. In Borisovka, 169 more are killed. So far, the vicious circle of violence has worked slightly to the advantage of the partisans, but recruitment has still been relatively slow. At the beginning of 1942, the numbers of partisans in Belarus is barely over 20,000. By early summer, it has more than doubled, still not enough to actively fight the vast German occupying forces, though. On September 5th, Stalin makes a 180-degree turn in policy by instructing the People's Commissariat of Defense, NKO, to issue Order 189. This labels the parts of war as a people's war and changes the primary objective into protecting the homeland and civilian population, rather than to fight an insurgent guerrilla war against the occupying Germans and their collaborators. It immediately changes the relationship to local civilians and will lead the Belarusian partisan ranks to swell to over 100,000 until the end of the year. Already now in September, they are organized as a regular Soviet fighting force behind the enemy lines, complete with central staff, communication lines, and infrastructure. In more and more regions like Klitschev and Mogilev Oblast, it is not the German occupiers, but the secretive hidden partisans who wield the actual military and political power. The partisans are by now a collection of groups of wide-ranging ethnicities with varying political beliefs who have only one thing in common. They want to liberate themselves from Nazi terror. But while the partisan struggle broadens, it is the Nazi imaginary enemies of the Germans that German Führer Adolf Hitler thinks that he is fighting. In a war that seems more and more challenging for Germany on all fronts, he remains convinced of the racial delusions that led him to start this war. That Germany is invincible as long as they can just kill all the Jews. On September 30th, he addresses the German people from the Sportpalast in Berlin. On September 1st, 1939, we made two pronouncements in the Reichstag session of that date. First, that now that the Jews have forced this war upon us, no amount of military force and no length of time will ever be able to conquer us. And second, that if Jewry is starting an international world war to eliminate the Aryan nations of Europe, then it won't be the Aryan nation which will be wiped out, but Jewry. They have drawn nation after nation into this war. The men who pulled the strings of this demented man in the White House have managed actually to draw one nation after the other into this war. But to just the same degree, a wave of anti-Semitism has swept over nation after nation, and it will move on farther. State after state that enters this war will one day become anti-Semitic. In Germany, too, the Jews once laughed at my prophecies. I don't know whether they are still laughing or whether they have already lost the inclination to laugh. But I can assure you that everywhere they will stop laughing. With these prophecies, I shall prove to be right. And so, as September 1942 comes to an end, it is millions of men, women, and children who have never even thought of fighting against Germany, let alone fight anyone, who continue to be the most numerous victims of Nazi madness. On September 21st, Yom Kippur, the last of the 254,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto are taken to Treblinka to be murdered in the gas chambers. The last transport with 2,200 people are the Jewish ghetto police and their families. In the past two months, it was they who helped the Nazis to round up the rest of their community. They too must now join the more than 800,000 who have been murdered in Operation Reinhardt across the extermination factories in only two months. More than half as many as were murdered in the first year of the Holocaust, bringing the total of innocent people assassinated to around 2.3 million. That is 
4,946 people slaughtered every day since the beginning of the Holocaust. If they were victims of airplane crashes, that would be 12 large airliners crashing every day for 465 days. But despite the unimaginable horror, it looks more and more like Hitler might be wrong. Sure, the neighborhood in Warsaw that became the ghetto is a shell of its former self. The whole city is a near ghost town. Almost all shops are closed. All vibrant energy that once characterized the Polish capital is all but disappeared. But not all Jewish Poles are gone from Warsaw. Not all Gentile Poles have been broken. There, like in Belarus, the Baltic States, Yugoslavia, all across Europe, what Hitler has truly done is not to defeat anyone but to sow the seeds of resistance. Seeds that, while he screams out his deluded lies, are sprouting in the shadows, sending roots shooting into the bloodied ground, slowly building a hidden network under the stomping boots of the Nazi forces. Seeds that might very well grow into powerful, determined forces of resistance made up of those who have nothing more to lose and will fight until they are either free or have joined their loved ones in the afterlife. Never forget. Mm -hmm.